On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I want to welcome you all to this evening's program with Margaret Warner. Margaret is the uh, one of five senior correspondents at the NewsHour. Uh, she's also lead correspondent for its overseas reporting. Uh, and in the past couple of years, she has been to almost every country you can think of. Join me in welcoming uh, Margaret Warner. Let's take Egypt as an example. There, what you had was the role of new media accelerated what was what was building, which was the sense by the public over 30 years that they really, that their country was falling behind, that they were ruled by a regime that was not only autocratic and self-dealing, but had no respect for them. And two events had happened, you may recall, just last fall, uh, in last November and December, that sort of drove this home to Egyptians. One was they had these total sham elections from the end of November to early December, parliamentary ones, that the Mubarak regime so blatantly stole that they won like 97% of the seats in parliament, which they hadn't won five years ago. The difference was this time that people were going around with their little cell phone cameras and actually filming what was going on at polling places and posting this. That was new. Then in December, you had what happened in Tunisia, and by now you're all familiar with the story, the young, the young vegetable seller, cart peddler, who is insulted deeply by a policewoman and then by city officials and completely decides to douse himself with gasoline and set himself on fire, and that lit a fire in Tunisia. And by uh, early January, Ben Ali, the, the longtime ruler, was gone. Again, the, the impact in Egypt was huge. I mean, they consider Tunisia nothing but a rival in soccer. But the tweets between the two countries and all these young people who were connected were, you know, okay, now let's all gather down at the Egyptian embassy in, in Tunis and demand that Mubarak leave. I mean, it was like, it was like a, an electrical charge. The irony is that the Mubarak regime had sowed the seeds themselves. And that all came out of, in 2002, there was this Arab development report that the UN helped sponsor that, that identified that the Arab world had completely fallen behind, that you had 22 countries with, a, despite all the oil wealth, a combined GDP less than Spain's. That it was a stunning. 5% of the world's population published only 1% of the books, and they were mostly religious. That 1.5% only one and a half percent of the population even had internet access. And that that, it was all due to a lack of freedom. And so these regimes, Mubarak and many other Arab countries, sort of got the message that for economic development they had to open up. And so they started granting cell phone licenses, internet uh, service provider licenses, and, and the response was huge. So in the 10 years between essentially 2000, 2000, 2002, really, and last January, for instance, internet use in Egypt went from less than 1% to 21%. Now, that doesn't sound huge until you realize most of those were the people in the 15 to 45 group. And if you really do the math and look at the statistics, which, I, which I've done, that was a huge percentage of that, of that age cohort. So suddenly you had all these young people in all these countries connected and communicating with one another. And as they saw the world they realized what they were, what they were missing out on. So while Gonim is let free, and he agrees to an interview by another private channel called Dream TV. And so they're sitting just as we are, and she's interviewing him about his experience. And he's very, he's not complaining. He says, well, you know, yes, I was detained, but I wasn't mistreated. I explained to them that we're all just young people who care about our country. We're not being paid by foreign power, and so on. Then at one point he reveals that he was blindfolded this whole 12 days. Mm -hmm. And people who watched it in Arabic suddenly found that kind of stunning. You know, I, I, I mean, if he'd said it at the beginning, it would have been one thing. But here he wasn't complaining. And then he said, well, I was actually in the dark for 12 days. And she, you know, she kind of said, what do you mean? Well, I was blindfolded. So they'd taken this blindfold off. So that was the first kind of amazing moment. And, and uh, this was occurred in the evening. Then she said, well, did they tell you about all the people who were killed. And he said, well, the last night when they brought me in for interrogation, they did tell me that a lot of people were killed. And she said, well, we're not supposed to show this, but I showed this last night. And suddenly this video started running in front of him and also for the audience 
of young people's faces, all the people who've been killed. You know, many of the sniper fire, I mean, I saw photographs from families in Tahrir, you know, it was always dead set, or I many were professional snipers. And he starts looking, and she gave this impassioned sort of um, elegy for these young people. And these are the, our flower, our youth, and, you know, did they tell you about this whale? And he started looking at this, and he started to cry. I always get teary when I think of it. And uh, she said, you know, the, these young men, and it, it's very dramatic. You can actually Google, Google this if you want to watch this. And so he was looking at this, and he said, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. He said, we never intended this to happen. We didn't want this to happen. This is caused by people who don't want to, who couldn't let go of power. And he, he was almost apologizing to the parents of these young people. And finally, he just said, he was crying and crying, and she's saying, don't stop, don't cry. And finally, he ripped his mic off, and he said, I, I have to go. And he literally flees from the studio. Well, the, the, I, was, I didn't watch this because I can't understand Dream TV, but I called that night um, someone I touch base with regularly, who, whose name I won't use, but a very well-connected um, Egyptian, very well-connected, um, sort of diplomatically in government. And he said, Margaret. Have you seen what happened on Dream TV? I said, what are you talking about? And he said, everybody's calling everybody. And it, what it did was suddenly all of, it started playing on this loop. And everyone started calling everyone and saying, look at Dream TV. And then I think Al Jazeera picked it up. It totally reignited the revolution. It brought, and people start tweeting and, you know, that, that we were running out of gas and now, now we're back. And sure enough, five days later, Mubarak was gone. I'm going to move us to some of the question cards that are on the Internet's impact on journalism itself and, on, and in fact, even your day-to-day -day, um, day -day reporting. And uh, the first questioner asked about how your research has essentially changed as a result, you know, whether you are consulting the work of bloggers and following uh, Twitter feeds, et cetera, as part of your source of information. President Obama gave his speech to the Arab world about the, about the Arab Spring and the American response to it. And I, he gave it, I don't know, it maybe it was, I can't remember the time, but it was very late at night, um, my time or, or American time. And yet I had to go on, then, then the news hour wanted to essentially come live to me. What's the reaction in the Arab world? Well, so we had our fixer in the hotel room watching Al Jazeera and translating, but it was, you know, I mean, how, how am I gonna speak for the whole Arab world? <laughs> it's gonna be a little difficult. So Joanne invited comments through Twitter and got like, what, 110 minutes and quickly gave me a digest of what everybody was saying. And I was able to go on and sound totally knowledgeable <laughs> about at least how the Bahraini spelled about the Obama speech. So it, it's... It, it's woven its way into our, our reporting and our research in, in a lot of ways, and I think it's got a lot of growth potential, particularly to skip, you know, it, it, you need them less with leadership than you need it with ordinary people. What is the meaning and what is the importance of the fact that now we will have, <clears throat> in essence, digital archives of a narrative uh, about an event from the protagonists or from witnesses of it, as opposed to always turning back to whatever the official narrative is years hence. You know, oh, I so. think that's terrific because that's like an original source. I mean, I think in that sense, let a thousand voices bloom. Uh, I, and, and you do. I mean, that, that's where, well, let's, I mean, let's take what's happening in Russia. The Russian election that took, parliamentary elections that took place over the weekend, everybody, I mean, we didn't go covered. It was like, oh, Putin's party, United Russia, they've got it so stacked. They're, of course, going to win in a landslide. I mean, I don't, not many, I mean, the New York Times is there, but not many Western organizations are there. Well, what happened was this time the internet got active and a lot of young people got, uh, apparently you, you can go back and track it and it's when Medvedev and Putin decided to switch jobs, you know, and that was announced. And somehow that just stuck in the craw of a lot of middle class young people who have been very, very grateful when I was there two years ago, incredibly grateful for what Putin has done in terms of helping create, frankly, a consumer economy. And 
then this one website called Golos, which means vote, started going out and sort of videotaping um, or, or just, I guess, cell phone taping election irregularities. And suddenly this whole online community was created and, you know, it's been an amazing impact. Let's talk a little bit about the economics of journalism in, in the era of social media. Uh, newsrooms are supposed to have shrunk about 30%. Oh, at least. Yeah, at least. I want to get a sense from you of what gets lost in that. What happens to investigative journalism? What happens to international coverage? You know, what, what do you see ending up being the, sort of the losing end of that? Uh, well, both the things you mentioned. Yeah. Investigative reporting. I mean, it used to be that no American major newspaper worth its salt did not have an investigative team. You know, whether it was the Boston Globe or the Philadelphia Inquirer, or, you know, not to mention the New York Times, or the LA Times, but all these great regional papers, the San Jose Mercury, um, you know, the Sacramento Bee. I mean, all these papers had investigative teams that went out and, I mean, it sounds corny, but, you know, tried to find places of, of injustice or malfeasance, and it takes time. You have to devote a lot of time to working with records. It's very tedious work. There are very few papers who, who can afford that anymore, and that is because the advert of the fall away of advertising. The big challenge right now is, even though more and more people are turning to the internet to, to, to get their news, the online advertising has not figured out how to, make, how to make that profitable. That's the bottom line. And yes, I mean, Time Inc. just hired a digital person to be their, you know, new head of Time Inc. Uh, there's this tremendous effort to somehow crack the code, but no one's figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, Jane, that it will come in the end so much for the media companies as the, as the advertisers. They're as eager to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not eager to pay more for the display ads, but they're eager to figure out a way. How do we figure out if we're getting bang for the buck here. And so I think that the, the tech geniuses that are out there trying to design it are going to come from both, both sides. Yeah.